I am Jeff Rosen, the head of the National Constitution Center, and the Constitution Center is so thrilled to be a co-sponsor of this important conference with uh, Ken Gormley and Duquesne. Congrats to Ken for putting this great group together, and thank you to my friends and colleagues for joining. The Constitution Center is launching this fall an exciting First Amendment initiative, and I want to tell you about it and then ask my colleagues uh, whether they think it is adequate to solve the crisis of free speech that faces this country. Uh, this is an initiative that the College Board will distribute to all two to three million AP students. So in other words, every AP student, uh, when they graduate, will take two weeks on the First Amendment that the Constitution Center is putting together. And the core of this course is based on our interactive Constitution. And I want you all to download this amazing app it's, uh, because it brings together the top liberal and conservative scholars in the country to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. So for the First Amendment, you can find Eugene Volokh and Jeff Stone nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society with a thousand words about what they agree the core First Amendment principles are and then separate statements about what they disagree. And we're adding to that videos by Supreme Court justices. Justice Kagan has just filmed an amazing set of thoughts on what she thinks the essence of the First Amendment is. And leading questions for teachers and links to Supreme Court cases. And this is the core wisdom that we're trying to teach all of those two to three million amazing AP kids. The basic idea is that the First Amendment forbids the government from restricting speech unless it's intended to and likely to incite imminent violence. You just heard the great Floyd Abrams declare that principle. He recognized it in the Pentagon Papers case. It was recognized by the Supreme Court in Brandenburg. And we tell the historical study about how it rose from the disputes over the Alien and Sedition Act in 1798, when President Adams tried to throw his critics in jail, and Madison and Jefferson responded in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolution that freedom of completely criticizing public characters is the essence of democratic deliberation. And then it was further refined in the debates over the Espionage Act of 1917 when President Woodrow Wilson threw his critics in jail. And Eugene V. Debs ran for president at, from a jail cell in 1920 because he made a mild speech criticizing World War I. And because of the great dissenting opinions of Justices Holmes and Brandeis, the Supreme Court came to recognize the principle that freedom for the thought we hate, as Justice Holmes called it, and complete freedom of deliberation so that men can develop their faculties of reason, as Brandeis put it, is essential to functioning democratic self-government. So that's the basic idea, and it's very exciting and very important that all students and all of us citizens understand that this principle sets America apart from the rest of the world and makes us more protective of free speech than any other country. And we're gonna teach it to those AP kids and then take it out to kids across the country and to adults as well. But we have here an amazing panel of friends of different uh, uh, backgrounds and philosophical perspectives, but all united, I think, by a shared devotion to that bedrock principle of the First Amendment. I, I'm gonna presume that all three of my uh, fellow panelists agree that the government can only ban speech when it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. And that hate speech, as, as reprehensible as it may be, may not be banned by the government and so forth. And yet all three of my colleagues have written eloquently that today the greatest threats to free speech seem to come not necessarily from the government, but from private actors. And they've talked in different ways and they've been on the front lines of describing how, in our anxious times, efforts to ban or suppress speech from private actors influence more who can speak and who can be heard than any threat by any government official, at least in the United States. So I wanna begin by that, by asking each of them, from whom do you think the greatest threat to free speech comes? And then we'll debate what, if anything, we can do about it. I'm going to begin with Juan Williams, because you famously had uh, uh, a personal experience where you um, uh, said something that NPR didn't like and you were fired for it. So tell us what happened, and then tell us why you have come to conclude that the greatest threat to free speech today comes not from the government, but from private corporations. Well, thank you, Jeff. So the, this episode's pretty well known. I've written a book about it, uh, and the book was titled Muzzled, because effectively I felt muzzled as a public voice uh, after I appeared on Bill O'Reilly's show, the, the Factor, on Fox News. 
and said that when I am getting on an airplane in the aftermath of 9-11 and I see people dressed in Muslim garb, it makes me nervous. Um, my employer at NPR, where I was serving as the senior political correspondent, said that was a bigoted statement and they did not feel comfortable with me working there. And it got into even more name calling and finger pointing uh, intended to damage my reputation as a journalist. Um, but they fired me. Uh, and I remember just being so devastated by this. Uh, you know, it was one of those moments in your life. I remember coming out of a hotel room and looking down. In those days, you had the USA Today, the New York Times, and the like at the front of your hotel room. And I, I had had trouble sleeping after being fired, and I wake up and I look out, and there, there are three newspapers and my face is on the cover of all three. I thought, boy, I'm in trouble now. This is serious business. Um, and again, this was not, to pick up on your point, Jeff, this was not the act of the government. Uh, this was an act of a private employer just deciding that an employee had acted in a way that they perceived as not being in the best interest of their brand. Uh, and I think similarly, similar to this would be, uh, for example, the advertisers that would, for example, decide that their brand is damaged by association with a voice that they may see as too controversial or even insightful, uh, a provocateur. And in, at this moment in American life, 2018, we have so many provocateurs in American media. But if you recollect uh, someone like Don Imus, the very famous radio personality, he suddenly lost his platform despite tremendous ratings once he attacked the black women on the Rutgers basketball team and several advertisers decided it was not to their advantage to continue to sponsor that program. So in that instance, again, here's a private actor acting in their self-interest, arguably, but nonetheless having the effect of removing a voice from uh, the public discourse and in, a, in essence, censoring or muzzling that voice. Um, this is, to me, part of this moment in terms of this discussion, that while government still does things like go after leaks very aggressively and, to my mind, oftentimes crosses the line in terms of suppressing knowledge about government actions that are taking place behind closed door, which is what, of course, journalism should be all about, holding power to account. You then also have a situation where you have now people in the private sector acting to say, here is the line that you can cross, and here's the line that you can't cross. And so what you'll see is there may be a response from one side of the political spectrum or another not in direct attack to the voice that spoke, not even to their institution, but to their advertisers, to say to the advertisers, please withdraw your dollars from this person's program or network in order to punish and silence them. And this is very effective. This is tremendously effective. The contrary point of view, of course, is that news is so often now entertainment or in a word, infotainment or personality driven. And that so much of that infotainment or entertainment, people make a choice about what they listen to one side or another without regard to the idea that this could be offensive, this could be insightful. Um, and so it comes down to the advertiser, in my opinion, oftentimes not to the government actor. Fascinating, thank you so much for that. Hugh, you've written so provocatively and widely about the First Amendment. You've said both that there are certain words that should not be spoken, extremely vulgar epithets about political uh, figures. At the same time, you've expressed concern about the polarization of news and the fact that citizens are getting their uh, news sources from red and blue uh, networks. So I'm eager for your answer to the question, what do you think is the greatest threat to free speech in the private sector? Well, first, I want to applaud the Constitution Center for reaching out for the AP students. It's long overdue and vitally necessary that it not just be used, but that it become popular, that it become a thing that people like to do, that students, it's always found uh, 
an easy spot with me and my kids. I always love talking about the Constitution. It's, and Hamilton is the greatest thing to happen mm -hmm. to the study of constitutional law in my lifetime, and <laughs> I'm grateful for that. But I am concerned about this. I think I am on solid ground when I say never before in American history have three private companies held mm -hmm. more power mm -hmm. over politics than at this moment do Google, Twitter, and Facebook. Now, the three of them have acted benignly in this country mm -hmm. to the extent that I'm capable of following it. I read a lot of Franklin Four World Without Mine, but they're not acting benignly in other places. Mm -hmm. And indeed, they are engineering the instrument of authoritarianism in China for President Xi. There are a million Muslims who are in concentration camps in China who are being educated not to be Muslim with soon the assistance of our high-tech products. Mm -hmm. So those three companies present an entirely set, a new set of problems for First Amendment uh, aficionados like the four of us, because it's not the government. But there's a good argument that maybe it ought to be. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Nadine Hugh is right. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. It does not say Facebook shall make no law. And Facebook and Google allow the banning of hate speech that is protected by the First Amendment and have more power over free speech than any king or president or Supreme Court justice. You've just written this amazing book, Hate. Friends, please buy it and read it because it's one of the most effective and powerful primers to the American First Amendment tradition that exists. And you tell lots of stories of people who've had their First Amendment rights violated. But if we set aside the government, Juan says it's the advertisers, Hugh says it's FANG is what they're called. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's the FANG companies. Yeah. Who would you choose in the private sector as the I, greatest I, I would agree with uh, Hugh, and I would also add as a concern the customers who are putting a lot of pressure on those companies to engage in more censorship of what is called hate speech. Now, I put that term in quotation marks because it is inherently subjective. Facebook recently released its so-called standards, hundreds of criteria for determining whether something is prohibited hate speech or protected. And no two Facebook um, content moderators can, dis can agree with each other. Uh, there are situations where uh, they have to appeal up the chain of command and it ends up being rather arbitrary. Now, whenever you have a standard, so-called, that is so vague that it comes down to subjective value judgments of those who are enforcing it. It's handing over discretion to those who have the power. And to me, whether the power is exercised by uh, the commander in chief of the United States or by the head, uh, ultimately the head of one of these companies, doesn't matter. It is depriving me and my fellow citizens of our power to make decisions about what we will see, what we will say, what we will respond to, what we will agree with, and what we will not. And whenever you have this subjective discretionary um, standards, so-called standards, what happens is that the enforcement is arbitrary at best and discriminatory at worst. And when it comes to so-called hate speech, what we've seen is consistent enforcement by Facebook and the others in ways that disproportionately silences minority viewpoints and minority speakers. Those who protest government policy, those who protest police abuse, Black Lives Matter activists, pipeline protesters, a number of civil rights and human rights activists actually use the term race book for Facebook. And a study was done that showed that uh, when white people and African American people are making the very same complaint, it's the African American ones whose posts are taken down as hate speech or their accounts are even blocked. Wow. OK, we've really put the problem squarely on the table. Uh, Nadine just said it's the customers. And that's another word for the citizens. Really, it's the tyranny of the majority. It's a clamor of the people to suppress the speech we hate that is leading advertisers and internet platforms, unconstrained by the First Amendment, to bow to consumer pressure 
and to suppress unpopular speech. And this is exactly what John Stuart Mill predicted when he said in On Liberty that the greatest threats to free speech would mo come more from the power of censorial public opinion than from the government. And now that public opinion is empowered at warp speed to make decisions on the online platforms without the cooling mechanisms and checks and balances that the Constitution Center sets up to stop mob rule, we are finding the suppression of speech. I'm just putting the problem starkly as mm -hmm. a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So Juan, if that's right, and that's what I'm hearing all of you say, we now have 30 minutes to figure out what we're going to <laughs> do about it. And let's begin with the advertisers. You know, the fa Facebook is its own, and the, 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 the fan companies are a big problem on their own, but you work for NPR. It's not constrained by the First Amendment. It's technically free to do what it likes. What would you propose to protect journalists, for goodness sake, like yourself, to be able to speak their mind uh, without being fired by a private company? Well, I think there are standards in journalism, Jeffrey, that protect both the journalist and the public because the standards are there in terms of accountability. You can go back, you can say Juan Williams wrote this, Hugh Hewitt said this, Nadine Strawson advocated this, what was said? Uh, and then you can go about making some determination. Uh, the problem here is that there are so many anonymous actors and even some actors who are intending to mislead you. Uh, the term these days is gaslighting. There are people who will just put things out there or throw many things out there in order to create a sense of disorientation on the part of you as a media consumer. But even worse in my book are people who are provocateurs, who say things who are making money by saying outrageous things. In other words, that's how you get clicks. Clicks equal dollars, and they want clicks, and if they propose, propound conspiracy theories, uh, malicious attacks on people, and the like, they know that they can play to a certain audience. You can fragment the American audience. Uh, it's no longer the case as, let's say, when Thomas Paine was writing Common Sense, it's no longer the case that you are sending your signals out to an on you know, a disaggregate, a, a, a total American audience. Instead, now it's a disaggregated audience. Uh, and you pick a niche, and you play to that niche, and you can make a lot of money, even if you are not telling the truth or not telling the whole story. Um, so from my mind, when you come into this environment, you as the consumer really have to rely on your own discernment um, and you have to make decisions about what it is you are reading, watching, uh, or listening to. This is a tremendous burden in terms of citizenship, but I think it is required at this time. I have the experience of people regularly approaching me to tell me what I should be thinking and saying uh, in very friendly terms, but one of the retorts that I have for them is, where do you get your information from? So for me, this is what I would call in my wise guy, private mind, you know, brain mapping, because some people will say to me, I read the New York Times, I listen to NPR, I'm a big fan of Huffington Post or Bill Maher. And then someone else will say to me, no, I watch Fox News, I read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, I love the Drudge Report, don't feel abandoned, Hugh, they love you too. And, and, that, and I'll know exactly who I'm talking to or where that perspective is coming from. The danger is the stories that get omitted, they don't necessarily share the same common American diet, if you will, of what is news and what is not news. Uh, in this environment, you can get a situation where someone thinks that Hillary Clinton and someone else are, is, you know, involved in child uh, slavery, was pizza it, cake. at a pizza, yeah. how, a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., and actually goes running there with, with a gun. Uh, and at what point do people in the audience say, well, this is nonsense? To the contrary, those sites are growing uh, and becoming more profitable, and it presents a threat then to people who have legitimate journalistic standards, which is where I started my response, uh, and who would say to you as the reader, listener, uh, viewer, that you should exercise some discernment as well. 
There was a survey that just came out recently that showed that it was of college students specifically, and it showed that a substantial number, I think if not a majority, a big plurality, are distrustful of all news media now because they're so aware of, quote, fake news. And I see, I tend to see the glass half full. I mean, it's ter to demonize the media as the enemy of the people is terrible, and we should resist that wholesale condemnation of one of the pillars of our democracy. But a healthy skepticism is a very good and necessary thing. And I think that you know the kind of education that the Constitution Center is doing about free speech is and, 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 and other constitutional rights, especially nurturing the notion of different perspectives and debates, um, will feed into not only passive uh, understanding of what those values are, but hopefully active exercise in taking the responsibility. That one of the things that we were talking about just a moment ago on a previous panel was about the gatekeeper function that previously was exercised by big newspaper editors and the like, oftentimes seen as keeping certain views away. But at the same time, it comes back to the idea that you could trust that if you picked up the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, you say, well, they stand by this story, or they will be held to account for errors in this story. There's someone I know who's written this story. I know that there's a real institution here. In the current media environment, that is no longer the case, that you can get people who will say things just to get you to click, watch, view, whatever, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily identify themselves, and they don't feel that they are under any responsibility to stand behind what was said. They just put it out there as grist for the mill. Hugh, both Nadine and Juan have talked about the responsibility of citizens to educate themselves so they can make informed decisions, and yet that's not the way people, we are behaving. There was a very distressing recent survey that showed that people on Twitter who are exposed to the opposite point of view become more polarized, not less. They dig in their heels, and on Facebook, posts that are based on fake news rather than real news travel faster and further because they're more inflammatory. So given the fact that citizens are behaving in ways that Madison characterized as factional behavior animated by passion rather than reason, by self-interest rather than the public good, what on earth are we going to do about it? Well, I'm going to flip the script and turn that back on you because um, you, you run an institution. And the Constitution Center is a very important institution because it's where it's centrally located. It's not identified as partisan. Uh, you're not particularly identified as partisan. We, so, not, we must be nonpartisan. Yeah, and so... My question is, what do you think about anonymity? As a steward of a public institution, I think anonymity is going to kill us because we've monetized conflict. And the bots have come, and they have swarmed every online platform. So what as a steward do you think about anonymity in the commenting on of the products produced by the Constitution Center? What a great uh, uh, question. So the founders cared a lot about Anonymity, the Federalist Papers were anonymous. Right. Publius was Madison Hamil and the rap star of the moment, Hamilton and John Jay. And we know from the NAACP case by the Supreme Court how important it is to be able to sign anonymous petitions. And yet online, as you suggest, people are more willing to say outrageous inflammatory things anonymously than there are. And that's why Facebook has a real name policy. So I was going to be the moderator and not tell you what I think. If you want, uh, later on I will. But Nadine, what about uh, abandoning uh, the presumption of protection for anonymity online? I would oppose that, and I'm so glad I have the opportunity to say that because I wanted to after uh, you first made that point. I, I think we have to have a balancing in any particular situation uh, because in some cases anonymity is an essential prerequisite for robust free speech, including speech that is especially important in our democratic republic, namely speech about public issues. Some people will feel chilled and will be deterred from expressing their viewpoints. Uh, for, and that it was certainly true for those who were supporting the NAACP in the past. But today, I don't care how controversial or hated I might consider a particular viewpoint to be. Uh, if people have it, I want to know that that view is out there, even if they're not associating themselves with it. In other countries, and in this country as well, whistleblowers, human rights advocates, uh, reasonably fear 
the government retaliation if they go public with their identity. Uh, Floyd Abrams made a, a, a reference in his excellent discussion of Citizens United about the disclosure requirements. I think that uh, uh, illustrates the Supreme Court has said in any particular situation, we have to balance concerns about transparency and accountability, which certainly further First Amendment concerns with privacy and confidentiality, which also further First Amendment concerns. So if you're giving a small amount of money to a very controversial political party, there's, the balance is struck in favor of anonymity of your disclosure because you would risk um, uh, retaliation for donating to some controversial group and you're not going to have much power to affect the political process. So I think we have to be, I want to take a more nuanced view than the seemingly absolute anti-anonymity I've been hearing over here. That, uh, that's a uh, helpful uh, notion that anonymity might be appropriate in some circumstances but not others, but some balancing is necessary. Just because I'm, I'm really eager, this is an amazing group, and I'm really eager to cast some light on this problem, uh, to continue to do it. I'm gonna, I have a party trick, which is to be able to recite part of Brandeis's opinion in Whitney. You've heard me do it, Nadine. I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna ask you whether it's obsolete yeah. uh, because of the speed of deliberation. Yeah. So this is Brandeis and Whitney. I think it's the greatest statement of why we protect free speech in the 20th century, and uh, here we go. Those who won our revolution believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties, and that in its government, the deliberative forces prevailed over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believe liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. That's from Pericles' funeral oration. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth, that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest threat to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this shall be a fundamental principle of the American government. So that's Brandon. Amen. Amen. So, so, but the question is, thank you, thank you to, to Louis Brandeis, um, absolutely. But, but Juan, is, that, is Brandeis's faith, it was all suffused in this enlightenment faith and reason, the freedom of men to develop their faculties of reason rather than passion based on the idea as long as there's time enough for deliberation, the greatest response to evil counsels is good ones. Today there's no time. On the internet things are at warp speed and with Twitter mobs and Facebook polls and as you discovered, uh, things happen so quickly that reason cannot triumph over passion. So was Brandeis too optimistic, and what do we do about the problem of time? Well, the, the difference is, because like Nadine, I would applaud what Brandeis had to say, and your rendition was just wonderful, thank you. Um, but Thanks to Brandeis. The media landscape has shifted in such a way as to shorten the time for deliberation as you describe it, and also, unfortunately, it has created a situation in which you have people who will employ that technology in terms of bots and the like to distort, intentionally distort the conversation and to undermine the credibility of facts and legitimate actors in that environment. This is a tremendous threat to democracy. This will shift democracy potentially, as we know, influence elections and the like. And that's why, to, to my mind, you want to stand by the principles as articulated by Brandeis or Rosen, and you have, a, a, I think, an obligation as an American uh, to believe in the power of reason and deliberation. Uh, but I must say that in this current environment, I don't see a lot of that being exercised except for something down the line when people start to consider the consequence or people start to try to understand where this information is coming from and does it have any factual basis. To the contrary, people react to the news as it's presented, news or new facts uh, or new theories, and this is what lights up the, the, the screen. This is what lights up modern American media life. I don't think Brandeis lived in this world. I don't think, you know, I think of Thomas Paine, 
it's, it's still said that common sense is the most widely circulated printed document you know, per capita in American history. Well, that's a different world now. If he comes out now, even not anonymously, but as Thomas Paine, I think there are people now who would be about sort of ad hominem attacks on Thomas Paine. And not only would it be personalized, then of course it would be pointed out, oh, he's English, is he this, is that. And suddenly the, the power of common sense is lost. Now, I'm experiencing this at the moment. I just wrote a book. They don't even review the book. There are people who don't even read the book. It's just people from one side or another then attack me personally and undermine people who might want to look at the book. It's just incredible. It's, it's a very dangerous right now, media, social media in particular, but media environment in general. That's a crucial point. The personalization of politics makes the discussion of public reason impossible. And in his other great opinion uh, article about the right to privacy in 1890, Brandeis is worried about a new technology, the Kodak camera and the instant press. And he fears that when gossip attains the dignity of print, it crowds out the space in the public mind for people to discuss matters of public concern. Right. So, so what, how, you know, Hugh mentioned this in an earlier panel, for those of you who weren't here, that we now have technology that would create Hugh Hewitt, deepfake. Right, and you say, oh, but that's Hugh's voice. I know Hugh's voice from the radio. But it's not, it's, they're just, they've taken it and they put it together and they can make you act or speak in a way that's not even in keeping with your true beliefs. The, the problem of deep fake is gonna overwhelm all of this. And this is why I go back to anonymity. I often quote Thucydides and the Periclean oration that the secret to freedom is the secret to happiness and courage is the secret to freedom. Yeah. Anonymity is the enemy of courage. Anonymity, in fact, uh, is fake courage. And so the, the mediating position between Nadine and mine is that you can give someone anonymity once we can trace you back. So feel free to make your comments on Twitter, but we've got to be able to find you so that if you dox someone, which is another problem that we have presently, doxing is the publication of personal private information on common boards. That's tortious in my view, that's an invasion of privacy. But you can't find who did the doxing absent extraordinary expenditure of resources, which is similarly usually only available to the Federal Bureau of Investigation because so many anonymity cutouts exist, so many encrypted apps exist. And so the collision of the reality of living in this world is it will drive people out of the public square. They will not choose to come because it is so unpleasant. I'm old. Juan's old, we've been around a while, we don't really care anymore. But I would not <laughs> encourage young people to, to sail without very wide open eyes into the public square. It is a nasty, nasty place to live. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I want to take issue with that, but I also want to come back to Brandeis, because I love those words too, Jeff, and I think they really are timeless. And he talks about liberty, including of speech, not only as a means to furthering democracy, uh, but also as an end in itself. And at the very least, the uh, power uh, and the right of self-expression is absolutely vital. And he also talks about an emotional component of speech, that which can have um, instrumental value as well in letting off steam. Now, I think that um, in terms of the danger, the real dangers that were caused by speech then, I always say to my students, we have to have historical humility because we tend to think, oh, this new medium is you know, uniquely dangerous. Never before in human history has there been anything that could do so much harm. And we've heard that claim made about every single new medium, going back at least to papyrus, if not before. Uh, and, and Brandeis, after all, said, you know, looking at an even earlier era, men feared witches and burned women. So there wasn't time for deliberation in the old-fashioned way to, to stop that enormous harm as well. And what I keep coming back to is even with the enormous harms that can be done by speech, is it, what is the lesser of two evils? Do we want to hand over to government the power to determine what is fake news or deep fake news or not? Would we rather enter you know, I don't think you have to education, the including education through the National Constitution Center? You can do it through the common law. You can do it through nuisance. You can do it through assault. 
We can do it through the development on a case-by-case -case basis of where injury is done and to trace that injury if you are able to trace the injury. And the technological chasm that is standing in front of us is invisibility of the enemy. And I think beyond a scale, anyone in this room, congratulations for being here, it is much, much bigger than any of us imagined, and the intelligence community will tell us that. Hugh, just because we're focusing on solutions, is a statute, a federal statute or state law reforms necessary to allow tracing of anonymous speech? I think so. In fact, I think a public utility model has to emerge for the uh, social media platforms, that they are, they cannot be allowed to operate as entities as powerful, it's trust time, it's the railroads. So the Supreme Court is hearing a case this year about cable and whether it can be regulated as a public utility, which could have implications for that. Uh, Juan Hughes just made a very provocative claim that Facebook and Google should be regulated as public utilities. Agree or disagree? I would agree, but the, I don't know it's that controversial because people who run these institutions say they're now open to regulation. The question is what kind of regulation and who would impose this regulation, and it is in direct contradiction to our founding principles to the First Amendment if, in fact, the government was to impose these regulations. But I must say that as we discuss bravery or cowardice in, in Hughes' terms, I, I think that I point to the corporate bosses at Facebook and these fang mm -hmm. public, I think they have been, well, they, they've been cowardly uh, in taking responsibility for running a major media outlet. None of us up here has the power of Facebook. Facebook's the number one source of news in our modern social media landscape. And yet they, they say, hey, we're not responsible here. We're not going to act as a gatekeeper. We're not going to have in any way to help you understand what is true and what is not true. I think that is just reckless. N Nadine, in practice, it, are, is Facebook likely to be regulated as a public utility? I don't see a political constituency in Congress uh, for doing it because libertarian conservatives who are uh, willing to regulate government don't want to regulate the private sector and, and won't make common cause with the Elizabeth Warren, Brandeisian liberals. And we're not going to get a constitutional amendment of the kind that Jefferson pr proposed, which would have prohibited Congress from setting up monopolies with exclusive privileges. So is that wrong or right? And if it's right, then who's going to regulate Facebook? You know, I, again, it's like, what is the lesser of two evils? Do I want government involved in regulating communications? I have uh, as much nervousness about regulating Facebook as I would about regulating the New York Times or um, any other uh, traditional media company. On the other hand, uh, do I want to trust the, the bros of Silicon Valley uh, to make these decisions for all of us? It's very, a very difficult choice. In my ideal world, Jeff, we would have um, very robust competition so that we would have many, many, many different social media companies, each one of which could carve out a different niche. It would have to be very transparent in terms of what it was offering. So you could have one that would say, we're very strictly going to regulate what we consider to be hateful speech, and here are the criteria that we enforce, and you can appeal or you know, dispute a decision that we make. You could have another one that says, we're going to operate like a common carrier, the way the traditional landline telephone companies do, and uh, we're not going to take any responsibility for what third parties say. You can listen to it or not listen to it. You can put up your own posts. Uh, but right now, I, I'm not an expert economist, but from those I read, they say that it's very difficult now for new entrants to uh, enter into this marketplace and compete. So maybe we do need some kind of antitrust remedy. Hugh, is this a bipartisan problem? In other words, not just the left suppressing speech on campus or the right uh, uh, suppressing minority speech, but a, a problem of the tyranny of the majority expressing itself online. And if that's true, then why yes. would regulation pass? Because it would be unpopular. It is bipartisan, and David Brooks's um, essay this week a rich white civil war, which I would recommend to all of you, does the new media uh, classification of America into seven political groups. 8% are progressive on the left, 6% uh, are hard right, and then there are traditional variants of both of those that are about 14 to 15%. And that's based on a very detailed study. The, yeah, huge, you. called um, hiddentribes.us. Yeah. And it's 8,000 in-depth interviews, and Brooks is right. It's very troubling because most of political conversation is controlled by the 8 and the 6% who do not represent 
the, the rest of us, and I would put uh, the, all of us in the rest of us, and if you're in this room engaged in this conversation, you're the rest of us. So how to organize that? I think it's a trust busting function. I think it's an antitrust step first. They're thinking about it at DOJ right now, that Facebook can be four companies, and it's like breaking up Ma Bell. At some point, the only thing we can rely on is an opportunity to compete, and the moat is too big and the wall is too high right now to get in, because they got there first. Not that they're the greatest geniuses in the world, they got there first. So time for closing statements, essentially. You, you have you know, basically a, a minute to appeal to our friends in the audience and also to your fellow citizens. If you could do one thing to improve this terribly serious problem we've identified, which is a bipartisan problem of polarization where mobilized tribes on both sides are fostering the most kind of extreme speech, which is going viral and tearing America apart and, and promoting passion rather than reason. That's the problem. It's the exact problem that the founders feared and that they designed the constitutional system and the First Amendment to avoid and were living in their dystopia and you've got a minute to solve it. So <laughs> one, if you, you can appeal to your fellow citizens or you can pro pro propose a reform, what would it be? Well, I mean, the, the fact that I'm appealing to my fellow citizens means that we can have an honest debate and we can have an honest exchange. And I would also raise this idea that you are fairly educated people, open to thought, uh, as evidenced by your presence here today at Duquesne. My fear is that there are hate groups and there are people who are intending for their own capitalistic intent, profit motive, or political motive to absolutely uh, mislead you and to have you uncertain as to what the facts and the truth are. And as we go about trying to undress them, Hughes says, let's do away with an anonymity. Nadine says, we have to protect that because we want to protect people who are fonts of unpopular speech. I think so much of this comes back to you, my audience here today, uh, in terms of demanding to understand the source and demanding to understand how credible this information is. You cannot outsource responsibility for your media diet uh, because when you do, you're like a child and you will be at some point abused, you're constantly condescended to uh, and misled. So this is really a plea in the modern moment that you would be active consumers of news. Hugh, your uh, appeal to the, your fellow citizens. That whoever is the next attorney general, I think there'll be a change there soon, uh, approach a cross-section of leading theorists, Cass Sunstein, Neil Kochel, Catherine McKinnon, from the left, others from the right, to sit down and think through what are the antitrust implications of the concentration of power in Silicon Valley, so that whatever product they come forward with is understood to be genuinely representative of left and right, and not a partisan takeout of a, uh, an opponent in the public sphere. And I think a DOJ uh, precedent for that is in the Attorney General's Commission on Pornography. From the early 1980s, this would be an Attorney General's Commission on the concentration of power in Silicon Valley. Thanks for that. Nadine, last word to you. Okay, so Zechariah Chafee, who was mentioned earlier, one of the early free speech scholars in the 20, 20th century, one of the founders of the ACLU, said, in the long run, we will have just as much freedom of speech as we want. And what he meant by that was we, the people, who are the governors under our Constitution, as those opening words salute, we ultimately have power to choose the presidents and the senators who appoint and confirm the justices and the judges who decide what exactly the First Amendment means. Obviously, that interpretation has changed enormously over time. Um, we also exercise our voice as consumers and members of the public and potential advertisers uh, with respect to those who wield power in the private sector. Those who have been complaining about too much hate speech have been heard. 
those of us who would complain about not enough free speech have not yet raised our voices enough. So I would say please remember and exercise what I think is your most important right, and that is the right not to remain silent. For defending the rule of public reason, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you, Jeffrey.